Thank you, everyone, for joining us for this book talk. Uh, my name is Carter Doherty. I'm the Communications Director at Americans for Financial Reform, and I am here mainly to let somebody else talk and let you pose questions, um, but I want to start by introducing Emily Flitter here. Uh, Emily is currently a reporter with the New York Times. Uh, before that, she spent eight years at Reuters, writing about politics, the environment, and financial crimes. And I'm going to assume that that's the origin of her Twitter handle, Flitter on Fraud. That one confused me until I read her bio at some point. Um, and uh, Emily is actually uh, trained in um, Near Eastern Studies and began her journalism career as a freelancer in Cairo. I always admire that sort of adaptability going from uh, um, um, Cairo to uh financial services. The title of her book is The White Wall, How Big Finance Bankrupts Black America, and it is her first book. Uh, it, the origin of it is uh, in 2018, uh, Emily received a tip that Morgan Stanley had fired a black employee without cause, and that became the toehold for a lengthier uh, look of hers for over three years at the uh, racism in the financial system and the implications for the racial wealth gap uh, and on and on and on. Um, this involves banks, this involves insurers, this involves employees, this involves black entrepreneurs. Uh, and of course, being a good journalist, she went out and talked to a lot of people who were affected by this and then connected it to the bigger picture of uh, the racial wealth gap and inequalities in the system. Um, I am going to start this by posing a couple of very general questions, um, but we very much want to make this interactive uh, for the participants. So anybody, if you have a question in the course of people, uh, in the course of this chat, um, go ahead and put it in the Q&A function uh, and I will uh, pose it to Emily. Uh, I am now realizing I can't actually see the audience hands, otherwise I would uh, just ask people to raise their hands. So why don't we just use the Q&A function? So with that, um, I'm going to, I think I'll start by actually, the, the origin story of the book is too good. Um, so I'm gonna start by throwing out uh, the, the question to Emily is if you could tell us a little bit about the, the origin of your interest in the subject. Um, there is this uh, little anecdote about getting a tip about Morgan Stanley. Can you, can you start with that and tell us how this unfolded for you? Sure. Um, somebody said, Hey, there's this lawsuit out there you should look at. And um, I was like, what is it? And, and it was a, a manager who had been fired from Morgan Stanley, who was black, who was claiming that he was fired because he was black. And um, his bosses had been really kind to him while the bank was under a, um, an agreement as part of a settle, settlement agreement for a class action uh, racial discrimination case um, they were, the bank was being monitored. And so they had to be like nicer to their black employees. And so while he was hired when the monitorship began and fired when it ended basically. Um, and I connected with him and I interviewed him and, um, he talked about having a terrible time, but he didn't have any, um, any descriptions that were like really, really cartoonishly racist. No one had called him the N word. No one had, um, you know, made a reference to a plantation. There was just kind of no um, like thing to hang a, you know, a definite determination that this was all the result of racism. And um, so I didn't write about it. Um, I didn't write about his case. Uh, I was uh, I I was left with a really strong impression of how hard he was fighting and how exhausted he was, 
Um, he had been out of work at that point for a couple of years and he, you know, he was just so tired of having to tell this story over and over again. Um, so I never stopped thinking about him. His name is John Luckett. Um, and it wasn't until I started to hear the same story over and over again that I realized that there was something bigger going on. Um, and what really kind of broke through the fog was when a former JP Morgan employee came to me with recordings of his boss saying racist things. Um, and another and a customer at the same location where this employee had been fired from uh, had also made recordings in which another employee said, you know, you're not getting the same services that other customers get because you're a big black man and the managers are afraid of you. And finally, at the end of 2019, I was able to do this story for the New York Times. And um, what my experiences had been as a reporter was I was uncovering a, a really big and deep context in which a lot of interactions in the financial industry happen, but which is very seldom observed. And that context is the, the, the racist climate in which we're all living in this country where Black Americans have not achieved equal treatment. Um, and uh, this book is all about how that plays out and what it means for Black Americans trying to get services, trying to work in the financial industry. Um, and then uh, I also explore a little bit about what we need to do to actually change this in a real way. Give us a flavor for the, you know, a, a sort of tour of the horizon of how many different kinds of financial institutions that you looked at or heard stories about or scrutinized data with, because um, you, you've mentioned Morgan Stanley, but it's not just banks. No, it's not. Um, I actually was inspired in the structure of this book by the book Silent Spring by Rachel Carson. I don't know how many people who are watching have read it, um, but it's a really great book. Uh, about how bad DDT is basically and how bad chemicals are that are that were being used in the middle part of the 20th century for um, pesticides and uh, things like that. It's the book basically builds on itself. So um, it starts out in the simplest way describing what these chemicals are and how they were developed and then it it expands outward. Um, and so my book basically starts with one brick and builds and builds and builds, adding bricks to display this wall, the white wall. And so I start with bank customers. Um, what happens if you're black and you walk into a bank? Uh, this is not a book about a single bank or even a small group of banks because this happens everywhere in every part of the country, in banks of all sizes. Um, I have found that as just a reporter, um, I get stories you know, incoming and there's really no um, safe place for black bank customers um, you know, in general uh, in the traditional financial industry. Um, so it starts there. Uh, it goes on to talk about how these banks internally deal with Black customers. And actually, um, one of the things that really helps illustrate it, it are these emails that I got that show J.P. Morgan Chase tellers in the Northeast uh, warning each other about customers they think could come into a branch and potentially try to perpetrate a fraud. This is something that all banks do. They all kind of have this system. It's not always set up the same way, but if you're a big bank and you have a lot of branches, especially a big concentration of branches in one part of the country, you might encounter the same person trying to trick different tellers out of giving into giving them money in different branches. So JP Morgan has this system. It's an email chain called Please Use Caution. And um, I was able to review dozens and dozens of emails in the please use caution chain. Um, the, the purpose of this chain is to say like, hey, you know, somebody stole one of our customers' bank cards and is trying to use it to, 
access that bank account. So here's the card number, here's the customer name, and here's a description of what the person who stole it, who's trying to use it now might you know, look like. But then I looked at a series of emails in the please use caution chain that didn't describe bad behavior like stolen card. It was just like a black person came into our bank branch and tried to do banking business and we thought it was fishy. So we kicked them out. I mean, there were many emails that just had that story. Um, and I, uh, was able to relate that to the stories that I had heard from the customer's perspective um, of how they were treated with suspicion as soon as they walked in. So it starts there. Then it talks about um, employees' experience in retail banking who are Black. Um, and then it goes more into high finance and talks about how employees, even reaching high levels inside a bank um, and working on Wall Street, still face intense amounts of discrimination and very few avenues to address it, very few if any. Um, I talk about AI and how AI is being sort of put forth as a solution to some of these problems, but in fact, there are problems with AI, including uh, the the fact that the the input of data into AI systems is racist um, because it's inputting data from the real world. And the only sort of line of defense we have is if banks are willing to say, we're going to spend the time and the money to weed out uh, the racist sort of operations that um, occur when these programs are created. So I Let me put a peg down there because that's yeah. a that's a really great point uh, about what they're willing to do. But we have a we have a, a very incisive question here that I want to pose. Uh, Morris Pearl posed this in the Q&A, which is, did the managers have some rational reason for being racist? Do they actually believe that they will make more money if they only work with white people? Is just that, or is it just that they dislike associating with people who have a different skin color? Do they start out with the belief that something is wrong when they encounter a black person? You know, what did you what did you get a sense of what they what was going on in people's minds? It's what I saw was a um, an assumption that these. Uh, customer facing bank employees were making about who who should have money under normal circumstances. Um, what do what do people who have money under normal circumstances look like? Without even consciously thinking about it, these tellers were deciding that if you're black and you have dreadlocks and you come in with a check, there's got to be something wrong. Um, that was. Uh, that's that's implicit, that's bias. That is how a lot of the world works. These tellers are 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 operating there. It's almost like the police. The police uh, are are incredibly violent and unfair to black people walking down the street in a way that they don't, uh, you know, that they aren't to white people. And um, the the amounts of bias that go into those decisions where you're looking at someone and you're assessing them like is that person suspicious and why um nobody's questioning these tellers no one on the please use caution email chain is pushing back and saying hey wait a minute you know you're you just described kicking a guy out of a out of the branch because you didn't believe that he was actually issued this check but like what evidence do you have that he wasn't Nobody pushes back. So the system just keeps going. It, it, it stays the way it is. The momentum is there um, and there's no change. And, and it really hurts the people who are trying to just do basic banking who happen to be black. So to some extent, getting back to Morris's question, did they have some rational reason? It doesn't sound like they really do. You're really talking about implicit bias uh, and it sounds like the in the absence of of a counteraction, you just this asserts itself um, as a way it, uh, as it does in many facets of American society. To that end, um, maybe you could just address this because you've 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 sort of uh, flirted with this subject at the at the fringes here in this conversation so far. But there's this broad um, discussion. Of, you know, there, there are people in American society. I won't call it a, a debate, um, but there's people in society who you would like to view racism as a sort of interpersonal problem um, that, uh, you know, if, if people were just nicer, um, you know, things would be fine um, versus the, the so-called systemic racism uh, argument that in some sense uh, race becomes 
hardwired into the system, racism. Um, after years of looking at finance, where do you come down on that question and how do you think about it uh, in terms of how it, how it manifests itself in your reporting? Well, I don't really see it as an either or. Um, I think that it, racism permeates every part of our society and our, the, the tellers kicking Black potential customers out of their bank branches for looking shady um, are, are not having, they're not individually, interpersonally mean people who go home at night and say, I hate Black people. In fact, some of the tellers who were writing these emails um, weren't white um, and probably experienced their own problems in our society just trying to get by and being judged based on their appearance appearances. Um, and so I think that the, um, the, the thing I'm trying to show in this book is just how much specific attention we have to pay to this inequality in order to change it. Um, I, so I wouldn't, I wouldn't ever want somebody to, to think that they have to even decide themselves that they are evil or good because I think that's really counterproductive. But I think if we all take a deep breath and think about how we participate in this system, we actually might be kinder and more understanding than when we started out. Okay. Um, I'm going to step back to when Morris posed this question because you said something interesting Um uh, which is, you know, what what are banks willing to do uh, to change things here, and you know, and how how nobody pushes back? You have probably experienced um, as a reporter. I certainly did when I was. Uh, that if you if, if a bank's got something going that's a real money maker, uh, they will move heaven and earth to figure out how to how to make this compliant with the law, how to, how to work around things, you know, lawyers will get paid thousands by the hour. But it seems that when we get to the question of, of implicit bias and racism, um, the, the banks sort of, you know, I've even heard compliance lawyers say, well, we don't really know how to comply with this. You know, there's a sort of, a sort of um, professed helplessness that, um, and, you know, in the absence of a real material payoff, what was your experience of of banks uh, in trying to remedy some of this of what you observed? Um, the The first instinct for any big institution in corporate America, and banks are no exception, but they're also not. Um, it this is not unique to banks is just to hunker down and protect the institution. So um, when an employee would say, I'm being mistreated and this person is treating me um, in a discriminatory way because I'm Black, um, the organization isn't going, you know, let's explore this together and um, see where this is coming from and fix it and make sure that this victim of discrimination is more comfortable and, and is in fact able to work here without being abused. Um, and let's make sure that the perpetrator changes and um, has to face consequences and also understands like on a deep level what's going on here and why this is this is not acceptable the bank is just like let's figure out how to make this problem go away um the the reason for that is um it they're really afraid of getting sued and they're afraid of having to pay out a lot of money and damages and um i've seen everything from just um sort of like negligent treatment to outright lying and gaslighting by the big banks. Um, in one example, uh, and this is in the book, and um, it's shocking, you know, to read the details of um, an employee at JP Morgan complained about how his boss was treating him. He's the one who made the recordings. He filed a discrimination complaint. No one acknowledged that he had filed it. And then his boss found out about it and filed a complaint of his own about the employee saying that the employee had had fudged some forms and the employee got fired. And um, before he got fired, he got taken into a basement of the bank branch where he worked and interviewed by two people from global security 
uh, inside JP Morgan who didn't give him their last names, only their first names and grilled him about this paperwork thing. And he was like, wait a minute, I filed a discrimination complaint. What about that? And they were like, oh, somebody else is going to handle that. Um, that's, that is the kind of thing that we can't often prove happens because we don't have, um, I, you know, I, as a reporter, don't often get someone who so meticulously recorded everything that happened to him the way this, this employee did Ricardo Peters. Um, but you got to wonder like who, where did this whole thing come from and who told these employees to handle this this way and how come nobody else got in trouble um only after my story came out uh long after the employee himself had pointed out all of these um attempts at kind of redoing the sequence of events even on paper that jp morgan had made in his case um only after the New York Times reported it and embarrassed the bank did they do anything, including firing the guy who had made these racist comments. Um, but that, again, was just to minimize the damage. Uh, so I, I really haven't seen a lot of um, willingness by these big institutions to go there. Um, I do write about American Express and um, an effort by their top leaders to uh, to bring in, to have discussions about systemic racism in a way that was really, really different from anything else I had seen on Wall Street. Um, and you can read all about that in the book as well. Let me ask you, um, Annex had a black CEO, I believe, for quite some time, uh, Ken Chenault. Was that under his leadership? No, it wasn't. Um, it was, okay. it just happened in 2020. But they got such a huge backlash because uh, this conservative columnist, Chris Rufo, wrote about what was going on that they stopped they stopped what they were doing okay so i so, mean it's really tough so basically they 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 started to engage in something somewhere between a diversity equity inclusion and systemic racism conversation and even that proved to be uh something that they didn't have the fortitude to hang on to that story you tell about the about the employee being based I would call that inter an interrogation what you just oh definitely bringing, definitely bringing security in there I mean that gives you some sense of how how the sort of the the set the, the sanction of force the the hint of force um can can be brought to bear under these circumstances uh in ways that you know we would we would find outrageous um Again, uh, throw in some questions into the Q&A if you'd like uh, some more. Um, I'm going to um, steer this uh, away, or steer this in a little bit in the direction that Emily started to go, because we all saw these very public uh, displays of uh, about racial equity after George Floyd was murdered, um, my personal God, favorite is the wrong word, but the, the sort of silly picture of Jamie Dimon kneeling in front of a bank vault uh, always caught my eye for the highly performative nature of it. Um, now, did you come away from your research as a skeptic of these sort of internal conversations prompted by external events? Did they do any good within the institutions or um, did they just end up being purely performative? They're largely performative. I want to um, give a shout out to City um, because City recently uh, sub submitted itself um, after a shareholder action, which was non-binding, um, to a racial equity audit. And um actually revealed the results of the audit, including admitting where some of the programs that they had come up with in 2020 as part of their racial equity pledge um, were inadequate and they could make them better. Um, that's the, like, think about what I just said. They got pressured by shareholders. They submitted to a racial equity audit and they published the results of the audit that found that their 2020 pledge wasn't working in all areas and they just admitted that publicly and had some specific 
examples of how they could make it better. I have no idea whether they're acting on those examples. And also this is just the racial equity pledge, um, which was a billion dollars. And, and I'm going to back up and explain what these pledges really are um, and not a, a holistic overview of the bank and how it treats everyday employees and customers. So I just want to give you that positive because I'm about to say a bunch of stuff that's pretty critical. Um, these pledges are uh, the result of the bankers sitting down or the, the employees of JP Morgan and, and all these other banks. And I, I go really deep into JP Morgan's $30 billion racial equity pledge in my book. Um, these are uh, the employees sitting down and saying, what can we count uh, from among our many business lines as being like forwarding racial equity. So do we make loans to developers who get the low income housing tax credit? Let's count it. Do we make mortgages? Let's count that because we're going to lend to black and, and brown borrowers. Um, the difference between that and actually trying to change is huge. And you don't need to have a huge pledge with a dazzling dollar number and make so just, it So just to clarify there, um, so JP Morgan made a pledge of X billion, I think it was 30 billion, 30. you said, and then they sort of started filling into that pledge what they already did. That's right. And, um, and so they, they came up with $28 billion of for-profit business that could count toward it, in, ad, advancing racial equity. And like, if you just take a look at the mortgages, um, they said, we're going to do lending to brown and black borrowers, um, which is great. Uh, we need more home loans to be available to these groups because, um, you know, home, home ownership doesn't fix the racial wealth gap, but it certainly helps build wealth. And there are plenty of um, historically created aspects of a person's uh, profile as a borrower that makes it more difficult for them if they're Black to get a, a home loan. Um, but J.B. Morgan didn't start out by saying, here's why it's really hard to get a home loan if you're Black. Um, here's how we've contributed to that. And here's what we're going to change forever so mm -hmm. that it's going to be easier. They just said, we're going to do X billion dollars worth of home loans to black borrowers. Um, the Before they made this pledge, the total percentage of black borrowers from all of their home loans was 4%. After the pledge, it's 5%. That's still a really small number. And the pledge has a, a limit on it. It's, it's like, it's got a time limit and a dollar limit. So what happens after that? There's also zero accountability. So they can say what they're doing, but we can't check. That's what their $30 billion pledge is like. 20 billion is for profit. There's uh, giving at the margins, but some of that giving is expanding on what they've already been doing. And I'm gonna give you an example of work that JP Morgan has been doing that they've been really cashing in on the publicity for without results that are measurably good. Um, they've been doing a lot of work in Detroit, uh, capitalizing some community finance organizations. Um, they say that they're lending to more small businesses in Detroit and that that helps Black Detroiters. Um, but the way they're carrying out these programs, and I was just actually speaking with a researcher in Detroit who's trying to track the effect that J.P. Morgan is having on the city, um, there's just no way to measure whether this is actually helping Black people. It's just, they can just say a dollar amount of activity that they did in the city, and then they think that's great. But there are all kinds of ways that doing that without actually caring about Black people could actually hurt uh, longtime Black residents of Detroit. So um, even in the, the philanthropic side of things, it's really hard to hold these banks who make these pledges accountable. And the reason that it's so hard is because they're not starting from a place of like, how did we contribute to this and how are we going to change? It's just, what is the dazzling dollar amount that we can put on this to get the good PR? Yeah, that's good. Okay. Um, and could you then um, 
tell us a little bit more about, you talk about employees a lot. Tell us a little bit more about bank customers and how you, how you came to conceptualize what it's like to be a black, you want to, you want to be a borrower. You want to open a bank account. uh, You want to do something. Many of us heard this, this uh, story about uh, Ryan Coogler, um, you know, having, having been, uh, I think they called the cops when he said he wanted to withdraw a certain amount of his own money. Um, Tell us a little bit more about your exploration of, of that experience. So I think there are probably people who are dialed in today who know the the term banking while black. It's like driving while black or walking down the street while black. There's a layer of suspicion that the authorities are going to put on you if you're black that is harmful to you. Um, And in the summer of 2020, um, I started to receive stories from people who wanted to talk about what had happened to them. Um, And they were, each one was unique in its details, but they were all the same. Uh, A customer comes in, they're black, they want to do something like take money out of their own account or cash a check. Um, For whatever reason, the people who are working at the bank think that they're up to no good. They call the cops, they kick the the potential customer out. And that customer doesn't get what they need in terms of service. Um, When I looked into this, I I learned about the limits of the Civil Rights Act and how if the if your business is not in a on a specific list of businesses that are spelled out in the Civil Rights Act, you aren't being held quite to the same standard of treating everybody equally. So in the Civil Rights Act, um, movie theaters, hotels, restaurants are all named in the law as being places where everybody has to be treated equally. Banks are not named. And banks have legally developed this, this just habit of racially profiling potential customers. And at least in the U.S. South, in the Southeast, um, in the, uh, I believe it's the fifth circuit, uh, in the federal uh, appeals circuit, Um, the uh, rulings have gone and there's a target case where this uh, is, that this is all sort of based on. Um, If you go to a, a business and you get racially profiled, as long as you can eventually get your business done, it's okay. So this all came from a guy who went to Target in Florida, tried to buy something, and the cashier, when he was trying to pay, said, I don't like you. Go to the next cashier. I don't like Latinos. Um, And he sued, and he lost because he was still able to buy whatever he had wanted to buy eventually. So I actually met a woman who took a check to a bank, uh, Wells Fargo in Georgia, um, spent two hours there, got thrown out of the branch. The cops were called, the tellers wrote all over her check. They accused her of fraud. Um, and then because the cops came and, and actually the cops were like, sorry, but you haven't proven that there's anything wrong with this check. And she's, she can show that she was issued it, like just cash her check. Um, they did cash the check. And so she was suing and she was expecting basically to lose because of this ruling. So, um, that just shows the um, really uneven avenues, even for getting justice, uh, if you're a bank customer and you're black and you've been treated unfairly. What about the phenomenon where you might not even know you have been treated unfairly? You know, no bank customer has insight, has line of sight into, well, you know, based on people who are buying this car for this amount of money with this credit, how did they get it? I mean, what's your assessment of the level of racism in, I mean, really, it's a lending question that we might not even know about. We only hear about it when it gets caught. So here's an example. Um, this A bank that is now Cadence Bank, which is, um, I'm trying to remember its asset size at the moment, but it's, it's, close to, I would guess, $100 billion, probably under, but close. Um, 
uh, it's got branches in Texas, Louisiana, Mississippi, um, Tennessee, uh, and in uh, within the past 10 years, the, the parts of the, this bank have been caught um, on paper telling everybody to avoid marketing home loans to Black borrowers in cities like Memphis. Um, and so that's like a really blatant example. That bank got in a lot of trouble um, for doing that, but uh, it, it just happens all the time. And and it's really hard to to find um, all of the it's it's hard to catch and and stop all of the instances. Um, that's why uh, some of the research around uh, that uses mystery shoppers is so good. Um, you get uh, two actors, a black uh, actor and a white actor. You give them credit profiles. The black actor's profile is actually better. Um, you send them into the same bank branch and see who gets treated better. You can tell um, from that what the attitude of the bankers there is towards regular people who walk in off the street. And there are all kinds of ways that if you're a Black bank customer, you could get um, discriminated against without realizing it. One of the ways is when you go in, people just don't give you the same options. It's not like they turn you away or tell you that you're bad or call the cops. It's just like, you say, I want this, what are my options? And they just give you a limited list. Whereas a white person walks in and they roll out the red carpet and offer all these extra perks. So there's all that. We have a question here. Um, was wondered if you could pivot for a moment and tell us about uh, the methodology, um, if you can call it that, your process uh, for coming up with the book. I know a lot of the, the backbone of it was your initial reporting for the New York Times. but did you find there were particularly unique hurdles, challenges in in writing about racism in the financial system? This question is from Dustin Duong, who is uh, with AFR. Um, I I'm not sure I can think of of really sort of like a barrier that I felt like I faced. Um, I wanted to produce something that was easily accessible to a really, really, really wide range of readers. Um, I didn't want it to feel too academic and I'm not an academic, so that wasn't you know as much of a risk. Um, but uh, so I, I really wanted to focus on the people and I wanted readers to be able to climb into the skins of the people who were in this book and just experience what they were experiencing and see the world through their eyes. Um, so, I chose to load this book up with stories. Um, I think one of the things that was tough was that when I I first began the project, my publisher said, you can't just write a book about how bad things are. You have to propose something. And I thought, oh my God, like, what am I going to propose? Um, I'm not like a, a an HR expert. Like, I don't know. I mean, how, who am I to like say what to do? But then as I was writing it, I did realize what the solution is or can be. Um, and so that was a journey that I also tried to kind of document in the book so that the people reading it can come along and sort of reach the realizations that I was reaching step by step and not feel like it's a foregone conclusion. Mm -hmm. So with that in mind, um, you, you started to prelude it. We have a, a question from uh, William Pierre Lewis. Um, what specific do, s steps do you recommend for individuals, communities, the financial services industry to, to take on systemic racism in the sector? You know, what, what struck you as making the most sense under the, under the circumstances that you observed? Banks and other big financial institutions need to totally change their attitudes. And the way they can do that is by supporting reparations publicly. Doing so will uh, require them to spell out why reparations for the descendants of slaves um, is a necessary part of the truth and reconciliation that we need in this country. The power that these institutions have in Washington with their sophisticated lobbying shops means that they can actually move the needle on this 
But I also think that if they come out publicly in support of reparations, they're going to end up explaining this to their employees in a way that may help employees understand better how to treat customers more equally and with compassion, um, how to be helpful and how to help Black Americans build and preserve wealth in a way that they are actively harming right now. And just to give you an example, going back to Ricardo Peters, who recorded everything, the thing that he recorded his boss saying was in, in discussing a Black woman who had come into um, $400,000 through a settlement that she had reached with a municipality because her son had died. I don't know the details of that, but it sounds awful. Um, this white bank manager said, this isn't money she respects. She didn't earn this. You're not investing a dime for this lady. She's going to lose all of her money. And that is the attitude that we are facing. And that is what is keeping the, the racial wealth gap so wide, that among many other things. So we need these institutions to really take a hard look at themselves. We can't do it by suing them for damages over and over again. We've pointed out what they've done wrong. We've uh, you know, so there have been cities that have sued these big banks for what they did to black borrowers in the financial crisis. Um, we need everybody to come together and realize that reparations is a brighter future that we should all be working toward. And I think that every individual should be supporting reparations and talking about it and seeing how they can vocalize that support on a local level. That's that's my proposal. Okay. And just if you could t turn around and, and connect this a little bit, many people on the call are, you know, involved in policy advocacy. <clears throat> and I wondered if you could you'd shine some light on something um, that we experience, which is you have all these uh, DEI pledges and, you know, the sort that you describe that uh, uh, can be done for, for PR purposes. Um, there is also the question of what what government fiat can do, you know, what what the powers of regulators, supervisors, legislators uh, can do. And there's a specific case that, that I know you're familiar with of where the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau said, you know, we're going to start supervising banks for uh, discrimination, you know, unintentional disparate impact to use the to use the legal term, uh, not just in lending, but, you know, how you treat um customers of color and the bank response was to sue the cfpb um you know, all the big bank associations and the chamber of commerce um and of course this absolutely makes you know advocates uh like many people on this call just just really want to you know, pull their hair out at the at the sheer hypocrisy of it is this uh in, in your mind this this regulatory approach is that does that have some chance of success or are, are banks simply so powerful and well resourced that it's just it's it's going to be done on their terms? I mean, it's a it's a sad, sad, sad comment on democracy if we can't, you know, enforce the rules on large institutions. But, you know, how 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 do you find the po how do you look at the policy levers involved here? Um, I don't think that uh, regulators should. Uh, hold back at all in identifying and pursuing to the fullest extent that they're allowed to um, the remedies for uh, discriminatory behavior that they see. Um, and I think that they should spend way more time uh, talking about what they see inside these banks um, and uh, doing everything they can to um, to make it stop and to make the banks change. I see you've got a good wrapped audience here um, that I know is listening carefully. Um, anybody else wanna wanna fish around? I could go on and on about this. Um, I've been been taking a close look at the issues over the past few weeks. Um, but if not, no. All right, then I think we will wrap it up here. We've gone about uh, 50 minutes. I think that's pretty good. Uh, and just want to let everybody know this has been recorded, uh, as I think you were reminded, and we will be posting this on the AFR YouTube site. I know there are a lot of people who couldn't make it uh, 
for scheduling reasons, and that was before the Supreme Court made the decision about student lending today. So I suspect a lot of people are, were, who otherwise would have been here were scrambling on that. Um, but we'll make sure this uh, lives for a while on the YouTube page. So with that, uh, Emily, thank you very much for your time. We appreciate it. We appreciate, uh, above all, I think I speak on behalf of a lot of a lot of advocates, we, we really appreciate the journalists who really dig into these issues, uh, you know, and take the perspective that uh, of uh, journalism as a means to uh, afflict the comfortable and comfort the afflicted. So thank you very much for all your work and for being here today. And I wish everybody a uh, good Friday and happy weekend. Thank you so much for having me.